Good afternoon, all, and thank you for joining today. Great to see so many joining from all over the country and from a variety of educational institutes. So from what I can see, we've got a mixture of universities, secondary schools, primary schools and multi-academy trusts oh, and a couple of colleges as well. So nice wide range there. Thank you for joining. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, please let me know in the comments if you can't um, and we will get it sorted. <clears throat> Well, we're certainly in busy and challenging times, so we greatly appreciate you joining today. Um, and we know that, that we have some awesome advice and some tips to help you in the various areas of the school, um, protecting the students and the staff, and also giving the parents of the children assurance that you're doing everything you can and doing it thoroughly to protect them and the future of um, their learning as we come out of this pandemic. Um, so. We have a few more just joining um, now by the looks of it. Um, we'll let them get on and then we'll get cracking. Um, also wanted to add a huge thank you to you all personally. Um, at Chespat, we've certainly seen the additional work and hours that your teams have been putting in to make sure that the curriculum stays right on track. So thank you for that. <clears throat> Right, let's get rolling. So a big welcome to the latest Chesspack webinar. Um, we're proud to have been helping the education sector for over 15 years. And during these challenging times, we've remained consistent with our ability to help, um, advise, supply, and um, keep close to those that we, that we help. So to keep them moving, um, there is just a couple of housekeeping parts that I'd like to mention. Uh, firstly, we are recording this, so there will be a full recording made available to those who are attending um, with the post-webinar resource packs as well. Um, you're welcome to ask any questions at any point um, during the webinar. Uh, you won't be able to unmute, but um, you can use the question and answers function at the bottom of your screen um, and to type and submit the questions, and we will try and get through as many as possible um, throughout the webinar. And lastly, we have our three amazing speakers. Uh, where should we start? We've got Jasper McEwen, who is a stone's throw away from me in the studio. Um, hi, Jasper. Uh, Jasper is, the, is a director of Chespack Hygiene and has served the public and private, private education sector for over 15 years, so plenty of experience there. Um, next, we have Delia Cannings. Hello, Delia. Um, Hello. Delia has over 40 years of knowledge and experience in the cleaning, health, hygiene and safety sectors and uh, work has spanned far and wide across the different sectors. Um, Delia is also the Deputy Chair of the British Cleaning Council and is also on uh, an external auditor for many education and NHS facilities. And lastly, a huge hello to Simon from Southalls. Hello. Southalls health and safety that is and they've been working with the education sector for over 12 years so providing industry experts who use their experience to give the, the schools commercially viable solutions whilst bearing in mind that ultimately the facility needs to be able to focus on teaching their students so that's pretty much it from me to begin with um, I might chip in here and there to pop your questions into the conversation but for now don't forget your pads and pens if you want to make notes and let's Hand over to Jasper. Take it away, Jasper. Thank you, y'all, and welcome. Thanks for the introduction. Um, just a very brief overview of who we are as Chesspack Kaijin. Um, we won't spend too long on this, but just to give you some perspective. We've been established since 2007, and we've been working in the educa education sector for a good number of years. And we ultimately, we do provide a number of products that you will use on a daily basis. So cleaning, janitorial consumables and equipment, as well as washroom consumables and supplies. But ultimately, although we're shifting boxes a lot of the time, we offer an awful lot more than that. We, we go that extra mile in trying to understand your challenges, your goals, and helping you reach them. We firmly believe that the right cleaning products with the right equipment and the methods and the training 
that we can play a fundamental part in creating safe spaces. And ultimately that leads us to our vision, creating thriving buildings. And that's what we are about as Chess Pack Hygiene is helping you to create an environment where your students and your staff can thrive. So with that, we will jump straight into the webinar now. Um, I'm gonna be covering five um, relatively short topics today bit of a whistle stop but we're just trying to create as much value as we can here so number one product selection not all products are created equal we're going to touch on that very shortly second point we're going to be talking about is um cleaning frequency and other key factors that remain essential for safe spaces third point is how we perceive clean and understanding that and what we need to do to ensure that we are actually getting clean spaces Number four, we're gonna be talking about dwell times and their importance. And the fifth point is dilution. So with that, we'll jump straight into the first slide around product selection. So this is a bit of a word of warning really, just to the education sector um, specifically, but what we saw over the early months of COVID between March and July um, specifically was an awful lot of um, manufacturers appearing on the scene that manufactured hand sanitizer and this was led by the short huge shortfall in supply around march when everyone um, was just wanting to buy hand sanitizer um, the, the world had gone crazy for it and typically they'd never used it before hardly um, and then all of a sudden march came and it was boom everyone needed it and there was a huge shortfall that resulted in a lot of manufacturers coming onto the scene not in, just in the uk but globally um, and there's a couple of warnings here there's an independent um which review there around the test results that they did, um, which basically revealed um, that there was insufficient active ingredient. Um, so where they were promoting the products as having 60, 70, 80% alcohol, they were, they were low, as low as 30 to 40%. So that, that's one of the points we need to just be wary of, that you know the products we're ordering, we need to be sure that we are buying from suppliers that are competent and have the, the um, certifications to match that. The second point on there is around substituted ingredients has been a, a, a quite a number now in Europe as well and in the UK, which have been, um, had to be withdrawn because of contained highly toxic products. So with the education sector, we wanna make sure that teachers, staff, and importantly, probably most importantly, students are remaining safe. And to do that, we need to ensure that the products that they're using, that they're putting on their hands, isn't gonna be causing damage. So just a word of warning there, you will see an awful lot more um, of these types of products coming down and down in price as these manufacturers are trying to shift their stock that's been highly built over the last few months. So just be very wary about the product selection. Not all products are created equal. I'm sure when, I'm sure Delia will be able to vouch for that. <laughs> um, so that's my warning on product selection. Um, the second one is, um, second point I was gonna to touch on today is cleaning frequency. So obviously as a result of COVID, one of the early government guidance points was around increasing the frequency of cleaning, which is, you know, that's, that's great and it's very much needed. Um, but I wanted to just touch on a point today was around um, ensuring that not only we're we cleaning frequently, but we're also cleaning in the right way. Um, every cleaning task that is required needs to have the right detergent, it needs the right equipment, the right method and the right amount of time in order to get a satisfactory and high standard of cleanliness. So just increasing frequency alone won't necessarily do anything, particularly if the wrong products are in use or the wrong detergent is being used or sanitizer um, or the you know, the, the uh, dirty mops being flicked around the floor for which should have been changed three weeks ago. These are all really crucial elements that need to come together to ensure that facilities are staying clean. So just the takeaway on this one is just to ensure that um, the team has the basic knowledge of the products they're using, how they need to use them, and they have the right equipment and the amount of time they need to actually do the job. So that's my key takeaway really there, because it is fundamental to a clean facility is to have those four elements working right for you. And the, the result is a compounding effect. So you'll see um, increased cleanliness, it'll feel cleaner, it will be cleaner, and that alone will give confidence to 
all stakeholders that the facilities are clean. My third point um, was around perception and understanding what is clean. So in the cleaning industry, um, for as long as I can ever remember, um, the smell is really important for how people perceive clean. So if, they, if it smelled nice, the classroom smelled nice and it looked tidy, it would be classed as clean. <laughs> um, but ultimately an air freshener can do that. So it's, it's really important to understand um, how we perceive clean. And there's a famous quote of Delia's, I think, um, we're fighting that which we cannot see. Is that right, Delia? That's for sure. Um, so there's, um, it's, it's really key that we're, we're fighting COVID. We're, this won't be, there's viruses that happen all the time in the education sector. There's bacteria that grows and we're not just fighting COVID. This needs to carry on. This needs to go on into the future. I've had numerous educational facilities tell me how much their absenteeism has reduced just by the increased cleanliness over the last six to 12 months. So that is um, something that a lot of schools are now saying that they are maintaining budgets that they've spent to ensure that that can carry on into the future, um, which I thought was a really interesting point. And I know for myself, I've got a, a four year old um, and in the last since September, he's only had one single cold and cough. And normally speaking, he's in nursery um, and normally speaking, they get an awful lot more than a single cold and cough in that period of time over a winter period. I personally think that's down to the extra measures that we're putting in place. And it just shows the power of real clean, getting those clean facilities. So just because it looks it and smells it, don't take it that it is. Do a little bit extra. Um, so that's point three. Point four is dwell times. And I can't overemphasize this enough. Um, it might sound like common sense, but it's it's something that we helped an awful lot of um, people and customers and clients at the early part of COVID. Um, we often used to see that, you know, if, if someone had a little bug going around the school, they would just swap out the multi-purpose cleaner and instead they'll throw in a, a hard surface sanitizer. And the same application, the same method would be used. So they'd spray the surface and they'd wipe it off. But the fact is the sanitizer would have, should have needed a five minute dwell time or a 30 second dwell time. But that was often ignored. It's probably a little bit strong, but it's, it often was completely overlooked. And, you know, operators weren't even aware that that's what they should be doing. They just thought they were using sanitizer. Um, so it's a, it's a really key point and message there that both managers and teams and operatives specifically know what dwell times or contact times are. There's a quote on there from the EPA, but it's basically the amount of time the surface needs to remain wet with disinfectant or sanitizer for it to work. So if it's certified to deactivate viruses within five minutes, then it needs to stay wet for five minutes um, for, it to, for, for it to work. And that alone can have a massive impact on cleaning regimes, because if you're now having to disinfect and you've got a disinfectant with 10 minute dwell time, then you need to allow a 10 minute dwell time within your cleaning regimes. And if you're doing that for every classroom every day, that all of a sudden escalates massively. So there are ways we can, that can be helped with that. So just check out the products you're using. What is the dwell time? Do the operatives know what the dwell time is and are they adhering to it? Um, a couple of key points there. And there is ways in which we can reduce that. So if that's something that you're looking to do, then more than happy to have a conversation, but it's been re the only way it's been reduced is by getting a, a product that is able to reduce it to 60 seconds or five minutes. It's not doing any quick fix and and you know making sure it's still making sure that the viruses are deactivated final point um for me um is around dilutions um so dilutions a bit like dwell times are something that are often overlooked and this is something that's plagued the cleaning industry for a long long time um and this ultimately is around about the amount of chemical that goes into a bucket or a trigger spray bottle um and how much of it is water. Um, we often find and I often see it as I, I go around and see clients that, you know, the floor looks a bit dirty. So I'll add an extra few Pelican pumps in into this bucket or I don't use Pelican pumps. I just, I've been doing this a long time and I just pour it in. I know roughly how much I need. Well, the, these kind of things um, shouldn't be happening. It's not only dangerous, it's actually effectively will make your surfaces dirtier. It will create a problem for you of um, residue buildup over time, which 
can not only damage surfaces, it can make surfaces look an awful lot dirtier. So just a couple of analogies, day-to-day -day life, um, tacky floors. So if you've ever gone into a um, anywhere really, any public space and you've, you feel the floor a bit tacky, that's often residue buildup, um, chemical residue buildup. The other one is um, pubs or bars where you've got a tacky table. That's often, again, it's just there's, a, there's too much chemical being put on there. Um, and that it can be quite easily overcome. It's not necessarily permanent, but it can damage the surface over time. So make sure that the dilutions are being adhered to and that your team, teams know what they are and how they should be using them. So using too much chemical is going to cause you problems. Too, not enough, you're going to have that same effect um, around, particularly with disinfectants, if you're not using enough disinfectant within a trigger spray bottle, you won't be deactivating the things you're trying to deactivate. So if a, if a disinfectant needs a certain amount of chemical, make sure that you're putting that amount in. Otherwise, it's not going to do what you need it to do. It's not going to deactivate. And ultimately, it brings into the question then as to, well, what's the point of doing it if it's not going to do it? <laughs> so we need to be really clear as to, you know, why we're doing it, what the products we're using, the dilutions and the instructions to ensure that we're creating these clean and safe surfaces. So that's it from me. Um, before I move on um, to pass over to Delia, we have a we are running a COVID support scheme as a company um, where we are providing a comprehensive cleaning consultation and helping you with a battle plan to maintain these levels of cleanliness that you've worked so hard to achieve. Um, and look at ways in which we can help you in reducing the amount of time certain tasks take without, you know, sacrificing the fundamentals of cleaning. Um, so if that's something of interest, do get in touch with us after this webinar. We do have um, a significant price support as well also on COVID related items to just help bring all that together and help <coughs> offset the increased usage in the education sector. So that's it from me. I'm now going to pass over now to Delia. Welcome, Delia. Hello. Can can you hear me? My sound is not very good this end. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you, Jasper. Some excellent points there, uh, particularly on dilutions and contact points. So um, a little reminder there for everybody of how crucial um, that, that aspect is. Um, I'd like to look at um, a number of things during my presentation, but I particularly want to look at the impacts of the gaps in learning as a result of it not happening during pandemic. Um, Jasper, are you? Oh, brilliant. There we are. I want to bridge the gap um, that's been created as a result of, of COVID-19 and that's one of the things that I'd like to, to, to speak to you about today. I'd also like to talk to you about the impact of behavioural changes on teams in our buildings as they're cleaning. And I'd like to also have a, a, a brief discussion with you on understanding the science of cleaning and understanding the differences between cleaning and, and disinfecting. So I'd like to take those one at a time, if I may, starting with bridging the educational gap. So next slide. The problem that we've got at the moment is that during pandemic, um, there has been a massive move to online learning. And in an industry that is predominantly practical activities, it's not very easy to help somebody to understand how to clean a toilet well on a screen. It's a physical application that needs to be done with the person. And because at the moment online learning is taking place instead of one-to-one face-to-face learning, we are starting to see a gap in that learning. And the gap I feel could have ramifications along the line where the skills that people are developing in cleaning, because it is a science, will start to erode because the focus at the moment is cleaning for pandemic, but we will not always be in pandemic and hopefully we'll recover and we'll come out the other end and we need to go back to basics, which is not 
using disinfecting disinfectant all the time. Skill bases are really important and education facilities are bridging the gaps at the moment by providing a lot of toolbox talks to help our staff understand things like the impacts, for example, of sanitizers. It, sanitizers are being used widely on hands, but wherever there's a sanitizer placed, there is going to be drips on the floor. And wherever those drips travel on people's feet, they're gonna be travel, tracked around the building. If they're tracked around the building and other people are walking on them, we start to see floors looking soiled that are actually not soiled through um, everyday um, um, soil that's coming in. It's very much the sanitizer that's been uh, tracked around the buildings. Some sanitizer are best, better, better quality than others. Some are very weak, some are very um, thick. If you've got a loose sanitizer, it takes forever to rub it into your hands. And it's dropping, dripping on the floor, getting walked around the building. So we're tracking more soil around the building and the sticky residues are becoming solidified with all sorts of other contaminants that are in the environment. So we've got issues here associated purely with the use of sanitizers. So we need to be training our staff to think and look wherever there's a sanitizer, we need to give an extra vigilant clean to make sure we're picking up those residues. Where the sanitizers fixed to walls, the sanitizers can splash onto the walls, leaving staining, which won't come out on some walls, depending on the, the material of the building. So we need to be looking at impervious plates under the sanitizers that we can just wipe over that will give us a hygienic clean and it will look clean, it won't look unsightly. We also have to educate our people, we've got to get back to basics with the chlorine because people are using chlorine based products in um, humongous amounts and doses everywhere at the moment because this, this, this uh, chlorine product, thousand parts per million releasing chlorine is wonderful to um, uh, to attack and the enemy that we can't see, COVID, but it's not so good for people's health when they're inhaling it a lot. And unfortunately, we are seeing cases across the country where staff are becoming desensitized because of the inhalation and overuse of chlorine products, something we need to consider for the future, um, our staff's health and well-being. Um, we also need to bear in mind that um, personal protective clothing that has been worn regularly, we need to educate and train our staff that these masks that we're wearing for hours on end become moist on the inside if you leave them on a little longer than you should. That reduces the, the inner membrane, which enables entry from the front through the mask because the mask becomes thinner. So we need to make sure that our staff, through a toolbox tool, through a little online video clip, or if they're using a disposable mask, use it and lose it, but change it frequently. The minute it becomes moist, it's time to change it. If you're wearing a reusable mask, wear it and wash it. And the reusable ones are not being washed in the main. I think people are sticking them in their pocket, in their bag, hanging them on the dashboard in their car, nice little ornament as they're driving along. And these things need to be addressed. So these are some of the impacts. Just as talked about contact times, and they are really important because the product won't do its job if it doesn't get the correct amount of contact. However, that's a little training point that we need to reiterate. And I worry that these things are being missed as people are fighting pandemic and upping their frequencies. Maybe we're not paying full attention to the training of our staff to make sure they have the information and the guidance that they need. Um, so bridging the educational gap is absolutely crucial. There are a number of things that we need to, to reinforce. Jasper spoke eloquently about the use of sanitizers. The use of sanitizers are absolutely useless if our staff, if our staff's hands become so dry that they become brittle, if they lose the moisture and the oils from their hands that they're gonna need in the future. We all need our hands and we like them to be nice and soft. 
And we like to be able to cuddle little babies without taking the skin off their cheeks. And so we need to invest in a good moisturizer, a good hand cream used regularly. We need to train that in. We need staff to know they need to keep their pores in good condition because they'll need them for a long time. So a good moisturizer is absolutely crucial. Education of managers and supervisors is clearly important for many reasons, but one reason is we have never seen a bigger use of agency staff across our establishments than we are seeing now. Agency staff are coming in because, hey ho, suddenly the cleaning industry is sexy. I want to work in the cleaning industry. Why? Because there's not many jobs anywhere else. So all of a sudden I'd like that job that I wouldn't have considered before because it was for my granny. Well, now I want to do a bit of cleaning. So when we've got people coming in from the agency, are they trained? The truth is they've got a heartbeat, they've got a pulse, but rarely are they trained in cleaning standards, in the science of cleaning and in the understanding of what needs to be done when you're cleaning at any time, never mind pandemic. So a word of warning to managers and supervisors and recruiters, check the credentials, and ensure training is given to provide the best opportunity for the service to be carried out as we would like it to be carried out. Again, looking at training, compliance documentation, COSH, risk assessment, standing operating procedures. Have we updated them? Are they embracing pandemic? Or are they the ones that we wrote a few years ago and we're still using the same ones? That's a question I would ask many people. Have you updated? Can you honestly say you are COVID compliant? Maybe, maybe not, but make sure your risk assessments are bang up to date. These are some of the gaps I have seen in learning. These are the things I think we need to reiterate so that our staff have everything they need to do the job that we want them to do so that they can help to be to form part of the army that is fight, fighting COVID, not with guns and ammunition, but with mops and buckets and cleaning agents. Training is absolutely crucial and bridging that gap is vital. But in bridging that gap, if we can't do a one-to-one, -one, if we can't do a face-to-face, -face, make sure the video clip that we're using is funky, is stimulating, is inviting, and gives them the essential information they need to help them help us fight to recover from this pandemic. I think I might have another slide now. So the impact on operatives on, our, on their mental health is massive. I'm not convinced that mental health has been really considered from the cleaning operator point of view. And the reason I say that is because I am privileged to be frontline every day. Today is a, is a lovely day in the office talking to you guys, but I am frontline in the health service and I see staff on their knees, exhausted, fatigued, worried, upset, anxiety, what's happening, what's going to happen. But what's not seen is the hidden problems they're dealing with. We have staff all over these buildings who have their own anxieties. And when they arrive into work and they sit down at their desk and, and Mary comes along to do a bit of cleaning, the first thing they say is, well, what have you cleaned my desk with? Has it been sanitized? Is there any COVID on this desk? Um, I don't want to catch the germ. They're, they're imparting their fears on the person that's cleaning, who's doing the best that they can. And they're having to deal that and manage, deal with that and manage it. Are we training them in managing these situations? No, we're not. We're not change, tra training people to manage behavioral changes. Changes in behavior are massive. People have been furloughed. They've been off work. People have, during that time, developed practices that are quite unusual. They're coming back into the workplace with behaviours we'd never seen, behaviours that include aggression, confrontation, violence. We have people coming back into the workplace who have now become rather fond of drink, who have taken to substance abuse, who have been bullied, who are bullying. All of these things are behavioural traits that will impact what training are we giving our staff to deal with this? How are we helping them? Mental health is a really important aspect. 
So the people who are cleaning are frontline in many respects. They're the front line in the cleaning and they are the last line in the defense. I think I might have another slide. Okay, so understanding cleaning as a science, the only thing I'm gonna really say about that is that cleaning is a science. Cleaning is the removal of unwanted matter. And to do that, we have to know how to do it safely. So understanding cleaning agents is vital. Understanding cleaning agent component is crucial. And understanding the difference between cleaning and disinfecting is phenomenally important. Cleaning is the removal of soil and disinfecting is the hopeful annihilation of contaminants. Now, microorganisms are around us all the time, some more dangerous than others. However, we are hearing a lot about companies that are going in and offering fogging services and ultraviolet light services. Actually, guys, there is no substitute for cleaning. Cleaning is the first stage of any process. Remove the soil and then disinfect the surface. If you go straight into disinfecting, all you're doing is disinfecting that that ultimately should have been removed. So if I was to describe COVID, I'd describe it, the virus as a peanut wrapped up in marshmallow, soft and fatty outside with little spikes and a hard nut in the middle. So if you use a cleaning detergent, the surfactant that's in a good detergent will break down the marshmallow, but then the disinfectant component of the cleaning agent will attack the peanut because it's been able to get to it because the marshmallow is now gone. So cleaning and disinfecting is a two-stage process. Let's break down the marshmallow and attack the peanut, but a word of warning, don't eat it regardless of the fact it's marshmallow and peanuts, it's not for human consumption. So guys, really cleaning is my passion. Cleaning science is a science. People who clean for a living are not cleaners. They are environmental ninjas. And therefore those that are fighting this battle at the moment deserve 100% respect from all of us because they're fighting to keep us safe. And when all this is over, let's hope our cleaning heroes are lined up to get the due recognition that they deserve for a job that has been well done. But let's train them along the way. And if I could give one last piece of advice to anybody who's listening, it is, if you're wearing masks regularly, if you're inhaling air environments that are unknown to you, make sure that you frequently and regularly blow your nose. It's not happening enough, guys, and we need to blow our nose thoroughly and regularly every day to get rid of anything that's hanging around in the nasal passage that ultimately will be inhaled. That could be fiber from the masks we're wearing, or it could be the COVID virus. I think if that's my last slide. That's brilliant, that delivery here. Thank you very much. Um, I was, uh, was going to ask you, um, how can um, our attendees be confident um, that the cleaning is being done to a high standard? So obviously, um, some may have teams internally. Um, they may not monitor it as such because they might look, leave it to the team as it's their responsibility. Um, or they might have an external team coming in. Um, so how, how really do they, how can they be confident that it is being do, done to the, the high standard, that the education, the training is being done, that the, ed, the um, bridging the, the education gap is, that's all being, it's all happening? Really, uh, how can they be confident? It's about the trust you have in your provider of services. It's about the management of those teams. And it's about the documentation to back up that they are managed well, that they are trained well, that there is record keeping and that we do invest in our people and records to prove that. It's, it's difficult to know. If you look at a surface right now, you look at a surface, it might look clean. How do you know it's clean? Because we are trying to remove 
that that is invisible. You can see a cobweb, happy days, we'll get it down. We can see lime scale, happy days, we can get rid of it. You can't see COVID, so you have to have the trust that the management regime and the supervisory regime monitors the outcomes to ensure they are measured as being as clean as they can be. And the systems in place to back that up are all lined up like ducks in a row. We need them all lined up, adhered to, monitored and measured. And that way we can rest assured that we're doing the very best we can in an environment where we can't even see what it is we're trying to remove. Thanks, that's brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, it looks like it's, uh, we're moving on to um, South Hall. Simon, if you want to kick us off. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you both for excellent talks. Uh, there's some really interesting points in there, and some of which will actually be relatable uh, to what you're going to see in our slides. Um, so, yep, so my name's Simon. I'm a health and safety consultant with South Hall's, and we are a independent consultancy firm. Uh, that works in the education sector. Uh, most of us are ex-enforcement officers, so we've got a lot of experience on the other side, so we know where those pitfalls often lie. Um, our main sort of service to the education sector is offering our fully managed consultancy package, where we act as your competent person, we conduct audits, we review all of your risk assessments, uh, we provide unlimited telephone support, uh, so we provide this sort of all-in-one package for everything health and safety. Um, so the talk I'm going to give to you today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID, uh, ans answering some uh, common questions that I get asked a lot. I'm only going to spend a little bit of time on this because I think from a health and safety point of view, most schools now are well versed in COVID, uh, fully understand the guidance. And so what I want to do is actually look at uh, some of the things that schools and the education sector should be looking at as we leave the pandemic, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, and those are going to be mainly focusing around a couple of things from the health and safety executives go home healthy campaign. Uh, so looking at health elements of health and safety as opposed to the safety, which is you know traditional, you're uh, getting trapped in machines. Um, so in terms of the COVID questions, I'll just fly through these quickly. Um, firstly, no, fire doors should not be propped open. Uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, people do this often with the intention of creating better ventilation in rooms. However, um, when you bear in mind that there are 40 fires a month in schools, um, the, the risk of uh, spread of fire and, and smoke is very real and very significant. And fire doors play a massive part in that. Uh, you should only be propping <laughs> open fire doors if you have a sort of automatic closing device like a door guard that will release it with the fire alarm. Otherwise, your cleaning and your uh, hand hygiene procedures should be suitable for you know, that contact point being managed. Um, in terms of staff wearing clear face coverings, it's been clarified, yes, you can. However, and it's a big however, it's only in certain circumstances. Um, so it's really in cases where the people in that room really need to be able to see the face for suitable communication. You know, it's not just the case if you can wear a mask, it has Looks like he's briefly lost connection. Um, we'll give it a minute or so, see if he pop, pops back on. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll move on to some, some of the questions and answers. If anyone has any questions, please be free to put them in the question and answers chat. Um, and we'll be glad to have a look through them um, and we'll bring, include them as soon as Simon's back on, hopefully. Delia, we've had a question on the chat um, asking whether you would suggest any particular qualifications for cleaners. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, there are a number of uh, qualifications that are available. However, I, I don't, a lot of the off the shelf qualifications are not really designed for uh, cleaning staff. They incorporate a number of things that are not necessarily directly related to their jobs. There is um, several qualifications out there that can be tailored exactly to meet the need of any environment. There is one particular set of uh, qualifications, which is the WAMI tab skills suite, professional skills suite. Um, part of what I do is provide training and education to the industry and I get clients to look at what they need in terms of what skills, cleaning toilets, scrubbing floors, graffiti removal, and then we tailor a package exactly to their needs. And what we do then is take a group of people, uh, before COVID it would have been classroom based in a training environment, and we physically do the graffiti removal, the scrubbing of the floor, the cleaning of the toilets, and they get a recognized qualification that is accredited through the WAMI tab organization, and the good news is that depending on location, local colleges who run that particular qualification can get it funded. So more information available on that if anybody wants to, to know. If you're in the Midlands, I'm happy to help. Um, but your local colleges should be able to give you information about funding available for cleaning courses. And I highly recommend the WAMITAB skill suite. Other than that, have something tailored to meet your needs, exactly covering things like the principles of cleaning, dilution rates, cross-contamination, understanding pandemic and understanding PPE and tailor it exactly a bit like a jigsaw. Get the pieces to fit where you want them. I hope that helps. Thank you very much, Delia. Appreciate that. And um, looks like Simon has reappeared. Um, Hopefully, if he can start his camera, and we should be able to continue. We also have another question in from Adam. Um, in the, he says, in the resource pack later, will there be examples of suitable products that you can recommend? And um, there certainly will be. Um, and Jasper, have you got any comments on that? Sorry, yes, um, this is something that we will include in the resource back. Um, it's very, very critical just to get the right products. And we can, more importantly, though, we'll, we're happy to arrange a, a quick call where we can run through the basics of those products and what it is that is required and what it is so special about them, if you like, why, why they're necessary and what they're actually doing um, so that you can take that away for the future as well. So um, another question that we had in was around how we can increase the efficiency of our cleaning regimes to help speed up the process and free up time for other COVID related tasks. So I know there's been an awful lot of work in the, the for cleaning operatives in and around schools and indeed everywhere. Um, and I know one or two of our clients of mine are looking at ways that they can help to reduce the amount of time certain tasks take. Um, in, to enable them to free up some staff time. And the key point here is um, that there are ways that this can be done, but we can't ignore the fundamentals. As Delia rightly pointed out earlier in relation to fogging, we can't, that's a prime example of um, certainly going back to, you know, the first six months of COVID, there was this sort of idea that you could fog everywhere and these disinfectant would go everywhere and clean everywhere and it'd all be good to go in the next day kind of scenario well that's that's a scenario where you know increasing efficiencies just doesn't work it's 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 flooring fundamental practices which can't be ignored so there are ways in which you can um you can increase efficiencies and um, but this is something that we can talk about but make sure that it's not um causing problems with the fundamentals Things like disinfectants with lower dwell times, it's a quick win. Um, you know, there are products that can get it down to around 60 seconds, um, but they are certified to do that. You know, they've been third party audited and they, they can do that within a shorter dwell time. Floor cleaning, um, traditional mop and buckets, 
may work well for some spaces, but if you're doing that up and down um, corridors in big universities and educational spaces, it's going to take a long time. Consider um, maybe different equipment that will help a cleaner do it four, five, six times faster and maybe even get better results. We've certainly had a lot of success with that. So there are ways in which you can um, increase efficiencies, there are ways that you can speed up processes, but it's not by ignoring the fundamental basics. Would you have anything to say on that, um, Delia? No, uh, Jasper, I think, you, <laughs> I think you've covered it eloquently. Uh, actually, I don't think I could add anything to that. Yeah, good. Um, another question that came in was around um, the safety and well-being of students um, as well. So there's concerns, seems to be a lot of concerns on registration from attendees around making sure that the safety and sh safety of students was, uh, you know, the, at the fore, if you like. Um, but I think it, Delia really encapsulated this really well, that we need to have all our ducks in a row. We need to have those basic principles and this isn't rocket science we're talking about here, is it, Delia? It's, it's basic fundamental principles of cleaning and managing, really. Um, but if you have the, the right processes and procedures, you have the right equipment and detergents, you're allowing the right amount of tasks, time for the task. Operators have been trained in the, the methods and it's regularly managed and checked, then you can be rest assured that you will have clean spaces um, but it's all about tying those, getting all those ducks in a row, like Delia mentioned, and, and having that process addressed. Is that right, Delia? Yeah, I think, I think if I was to summarise the key ingredients, it would be my four T's, having the four T's in place, which is the time to do the job, the tools that are correct to do the job, the techniques, i.e. the methodology that is appropriate and correct, and finally, the training. So give me four T's and I'll give you a good job. Very good one. I like that. <laughs> good. Well, thanks for that, Delia. Um, Simon looks like he's back now. Are you? I am. Um, correct, so Simon? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the risk of working at home in the pandemic is a catastrophic hardware failure halfway through a <laughs> webinar. So uh, no very worries. sorry for dropping out on you all there. I've uh, come back as quick as I could. Yeah, no um, problem. We'll fire away. So, no problem. So I'll, I'll only whiz through these. Um, it looks like these have been on the screen while I'm away. Um, so, yeah, uh, where were we? Um, uh, employees in bubbles still make sure they're maintaining two metre distancing. Um, in schools, I've had catering staff that are just, you know, in each other's faces because they say they're in a bubble. That's not controlling the risk between them. They need to maintain distancing. Um, can you insist staff and students participate in asymptomatic testing? No, you can't. It's a voluntary scheme and it requires consent. Um, it's not something that can be forced upon anyone. So on that basis, see, this is a, a lovely extra for those who do participate, but it's not the be all and end all of your systems. You need to make sure everything else is still in place. And can shielding staff and pupils return to school after having their vaccine? Currently, no. The guidance is very much that anyone who's had their vaccine needs to continue shielding for the time being. I suspect that as the uh, the numbers of vaccines increase and the evidence base around those vaccines and the impact in, you know, uh, gets greater, then at some point those people will be sort of released from shielding and, and allowed back <coughs> for the time being. They have to maintain that shielding. Okay. So I want to talk uh, mainly about COSH, and this is one of those health elements that, that we need to talk about uh, as we leave the pandemic. Uh, it's obviously very relevant to cleaning. Um, and there's a few interesting points that uh, you've both raised along the way that will feed into this. Now, one, my experience from uh, COSH within the education sector is often when we get new clients, and particularly the smaller clients, smaller academies, um, the COSH assessments don't really exist and they either don't have the cost assessments or when I ask to see them, I'm produced with material safety data sheets. <laughs> now, I want to make this point really clear because material safety data sheets give you the information about the chemical. What they don't say is how you use them and how you make sure that your employees and those on your sites are safe from the effects of these chemicals. And that's the bit where the cost assessment process comes in. And that's what I encourage all of you to look at to make sure that you've got this process in place in your organization. And um, now this is quite a simple process. It doesn't, you know, it's not something you need to be scared of. 
Um, it's basically looking at the material safety data sheet. That gives you the key information about your chemical. Consider how you're using it, who's using it, how often they're using it, and in what environment. Um, and from that, you'll be able to get an idea of the, the routes of exposure, how dangerous this could be. Um, and then that'll allow you to create a suitable uh, safe system of work using those control measures to make sure that that use of the chemical is safe. And that is the end goal. That's the real aim of a cost assessment. It's not a tick box exercise. It's looking at how can we use these chemicals safely. I mean, the, in terms of those controls, there's a hierarchy there on the page. You can see it ranges from the ideal is avoid that hazardous chemical and use something that's safer. Um, going right the way down to the last resort of provide PPE. You know, that, that's a very much a last resort. Now, interestingly, you know, as you said, Jasper, dilution is key. Um, that's very much the same from a cost point of view as well. What you'll find with a lot of strong cleaning chemicals is in their neat form, they are very hazardous. But as that gets diluted down, the risk is significantly reduced. So using it at the correct dilution is key. And that's something that your cost assessment should pull out. Um, now, you'll have a lot of chemicals used in your facilities teams. If you're at secondary schools or universities, you'll obviously have a lot of chemicals in things like design and technology, in science labs, in specialist departments. Um, for a lot of schools, you'll find uh, resources that will help you do cost assessments really easily. Uh, I've listed their CLEPS. They're one that we often refer to who have excellent uh, resources for using chemicals in classrooms uh, and storage of chemicals in labs and in DT departments. But have a look around and see if there's anything else that you've missed in your school. Um, there'll be things like um, paint thinners um, in your DT departments, in your art departments, and you'll probably even find you've got solvent sprays, you know, air fresheners kicking around in classrooms on windowsills ready to pop in sunlight um, or be sprayed by a child. You know, th these are the things that we find quite commonly. Um, and then, as you've uh, also alluded to, uh, training is key. When you get these risk these cost assessments produced, you've got to train your staff in those safe systems of work so that they know how to use those chemicals safely and they can do so safely. Um, I've got a little tiny bit at the end there uh, just on welding fume and wood dust, uh, just as a bonus. Just to make the point that COSH, you know, we primarily think about hazardous substances being those with a hazard label in a tin, in a can, in a bottle. But there are things like welding fume and wood dust. These are hazardous substances that you need to think about. They will often be controlled in schools um, through your risk assessment process following industry guidance like GLEEPS. But do make sure that you are considering them. The regulations on wood dust and welding fume have tightened significantly in the last couple of years. Uh, so you need to make sure that those other hazardous substances are carefully controlled as well. OK, next slide, please. Thank you. So th this is another element um, that is very much a health impact as well as the safety side. Um, now, similarly to uh, chemicals, you know, with chemicals, with manual handling, if you don't have safe systems of work in place and if you are misusing chemicals or if you are mis you know, not following correct procedures for manual handling, you might have immediate um, health impacts. So you might have immediate uh, injuries that result but a lot of these injuries build up over time and they present themselves later in life. And so by that point, if you haven't got these controls in place, the damage is done. You know, it's too late to do much about it. Um, so it's really important that you get these risk assessments done as soon as possible and make sure they're in play straight away rather than when it, uh, some, you know, an issue presents itself. Now, with manual handling, you've probably done basic manual handling training with your employees. That's great for low risk tasks. So your general movement of boxes of paper, your general movement of things around school. However, what they don't cover uh, in enough detail are your high risk activities. So you're going to have a, um, some activities within your school, some manual handling activities that would be high risk. And that's anything where the item's too heavy, too bulky uh, to carry easily following that basic practice that, and requires additional thought. So consider their activities like moving furniture, moving heavy gym equipment, uh, dining tables, stacks of chairs, staging. You know, they're, they're some of the common examples I see. For those activities, you should be doing specific manual handling assessments. Similar, uh, you know, similar to cost assessments, it doesn't require you to be an expert. You don't have to know um, about physics and momentum. You just have to be able to follow the basic principles. 
But that said, there are e-learning courses available that help to train you in that process and they're very cost effective and very quick. So they're well worth looking into if the person doing the manual handling assessment has any concern. Now in doing that assessment, it's looking at what is the load? You know, what am I moving? How am I moving it? Where am I moving it through? And then thinking, how can I make this safer? You know, can I use manual handling aids? Can I use purpose-built trolleys? Um, can I split down the load or can I do it with another person following a safe system of work? You know, looking at the, the specific, specific risks posed by that activity will help you to find these controls. And as long as you ha then have those controls documented, you know, you've gone through that process in a documented form and then you teach again, you provide the training to your employees to say, if you're going to do this task, this is how you do it safely. Please follow this task. Again, you've got that training in place to make sure they can do it safely. Okay, so that's a, a whistle stop tour of manual handling there. Again, please look at the activities that you've got in your site and just consider whether you've actually got those activities thoroughly thought through and thoroughly assessed and your staff trained. Now, why is this important? You know, this applies to a whole range of elements in any sector, including schools. But fundamentally, going through this process of doing the specific assessments and providing the training to your employees will massively cut down on the occurrence of injuries and the long-term health impacts. Um, now that is both a moral and a legal duty. You have to pre uh, protect the health and safety of your employees and those on your site. But also, you know, as um, you know, heads of your organizations, as heads of facilities, you know, there is also the element that if these incidents take place, if these health uh, effects occur down the line, then you are liable for civil action as well. And this is increasing, especially as these health impacts build over time, we're seeing a huge increase in civil cases. And um, the first thing that your solicitor is gonna ask is do we have risk assessments to cover the activities in this alleged complaint? And do we have evidence of training? If the answer to either of those questions is no, your liability goes up and the amount that you're gonna probably have to pay out goes up as well. So these are your first elements to due diligence in any defense against those claims. So there's the two arms, you've got the moral and the social duty, but you've also got that business element of trying to make sure that you are uh, protecting yourselves from these civil claims in the future. Um, now, again, like I say, e-learning will cover the basics, that will cover the, the fundamentals and the low risk elements, but make sure you supplement that with the risk assessments and with the specific training that comes from those risk assessments. Okay, next slide, please. So that leads on to uh, a final element. You know, this is almost a bonus, really. Uh, it's something else that I'm seeing in schools that is either, you know, I, I see a complete um, contrast. Some organizations have this down to a T. Uh, your larger organizations, your universities have probably got this done really, really well. However, for the smaller academy trusts, Often uh, this isn't considered in the detail that it really needs to be. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's contractor management, as you can see on the, on the page there. Now, the reason this is important is because there's a misconception that any contractor on site, they're responsible for their own health and safety. And that's where the, you know, the employer's liability ends, you know, the school's liability ends. That's not entirely true. Um, whilst fundamentally the employer of that contractor is responsible for their health and safety, the school or anyone who's contracted them in does retain an element of liability for the work that uh, that they undertake on your site. So you know, there, there are two elements here, really. You've got your low risk activities, your low risk contractor work and your high risk. Now for any of that contractor work, you should be thinking about what is the scope of the work that this contractor is gonna do on my site? Um, what are the risks that they are likely to be exposed to while on my site? and then communicate that with the contractor, plan the tasks accordingly, uh, bearing those in mind. Um, now the contractor should be qualified, they should have adequate insurance, and they may well be accredited as well to relevant industry bodies. And um, that will help you, help to give you some assurance that they really know what they're talking about. But what you need to do as, uh, you know, as an organization is uh, discuss how they're going to manage the risks on site um, and, if it's a high risk task, you need to make sure that this is really thoroughly documented and thought through. Uh, and by high risk, I'm talking things like working with live electrics, uh, working at height, you know, on roofs. Uh, those are two of the big things where I find this uh, falls down. So for any of that high risk work, the contractor should be able to provide you with something called a RAMS pack. So that's risk assessments and method, method statements. 
The combination of those should look through the risks that they're exposed to on your site and how they're going to perform that task safely to make sure that you know, the risk to themselves, to your employees and to anyone else on site, such as your students, will be you know, maintained. They will be safe. Um, and you need to consider, you know, is there anything else that we need to tell them about our site? Is there any other system that we need to put in place to make sure this is going to function and everyone's going to be safe? The, uh, the example I often give is if you just leave an electrician to get on with the job and you don't consider it any further, what happens if they isolate the electrics using a fuse cab you know, uh, consume unit, you know, flicking the switch? They're working on some live electrics and then a teacher working late at night realizes that the power's gone down to their computer. They find the consumer unit, they flick the switch and the electrician on the other side of the building's just been giving uh, an electric shock. Now you need to have procedures in place to make sure that that uh, electric will be isolated and will remain isolated at the electrician's control for the extent of the task. Same sort of principle for any high risk work. Um, and in doing so, you then issue a permit to work. Um, now that's the key phrase, you know, it's, it's a documented system that allows that person to, to undertake the task safely in a given set of uh, control measures, you know, in a given procedure. And I'd encourage anyone here to look back at how they manage their contractors on site and just think back, have we checked that these things are in place? Have we looked at how they're actually doing the task or have we just entirely entrusted it to the contractor? Um, and if it's high risk work, have we ever issued permits to work or is this something that we need to look at further to make sure they're going to be uh, safe for any future work? Okay, so that's really the, the end of my slides. Um, I'll conscious of time, so very quickly, there's uh, two things that I just want to uh, sort of state to the Chesspack uh, customers here. We do have two packages that, are, that we're currently offering on a sort of COVID basis. One is a compliance check. That's fundamentally a site audit uh, to make sure that everything you're doing is in line with current guidance and to give you some assurance that your uh, COVID control measures are as robust as they should be. Um, but also, you know, in doing that, we can often help you, uh, you know, make sure that they're actually pragmatic as well uh, and not going overboard. And uh, we're offering 10% off uh, those packages for Chessback customers. Um, and then the final package is a sort of brief introduction almost into our fully managed contract, uh, but with the COVID focus. And that's a three month package um, of providing you with our uh, health and safety software called Safety Cloud that gives you access to e-learning modules, um, including infection control and temporary home working uh, e-learning. Um, as part of that, we will assist you with uh, your COVID-19 risk assessment to make sure that's fully up to speed and provide you with regular updates um, and also provide you with other materials such as really useful posters, return to work health questionnaires uh, and a full wrath, you know, a full uh, sort of span of uh, support documents. And again, we're offering a 10% discount on that for Chessback customers at the moment. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, appreciate your time on that. I was going to ask you a quick question. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a few things on the market at the minute that um, parents might actually um, start looking at the legal side of how is the, how is the school or what is the school doing um, to document the cleaning, et cetera, and to keep my students safe? Um, what could you give us an insight into what actually needs to be um, documented as such, so you've, you mentioned the risk assessments. Is there anything else specifically related to the the COVID um, situation that if if a parent was to to um, take legal action against the school about about it, um, what would what would the school need? Absolutely, it's a great question. Um, the the first thing you know, it always comes back to due diligence. How do you demonstrate that the things that you've said you're going to do have been done? Um, with cleaning, you know, for our clients, we're recommending that they do uh, two levels of documentation. One is a sort of a daily checklist to ensure that the cleaning has been done as expected, that a check of sanitizer and cleaning materials are in place where they should be, um, that windows are suitably open. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a uh, you know, too onerous and you can break that down to however that's going to be pragmatic to achieve on site, but some sort of easy quick checklist to make sure these things are in place. Um, as Delia mentioned, uh, records of the cleaning that's taking place, again, that could be an easy checklist on site. Um, 
our clients, you know, we recommend that they use a checklist within Safety Cloud so they can be done in real time, very quickly on the system, and they're uploaded you know, straight into the system. So there's no scanning, no paperwork to get lost, and management can see that straight away and easily report on it. Um, but then also consider, uh, consider auditing as well. Um, and this bit you know, is really key. If you're in a big organization, you've probably got really robust risk assessments, really robust procedures. But if you go and check how those are being implemented on site, you will probably find that there's miscommunication that's fallen as it's got lower uh, down and to the people on the ground. And um, the fire doors that I mentioned at the start, that's a big one that gets, you know, mis uh, that gets confused by the end of it. Having uh, regular audits of your site, Again, they don't have to be uh, too onerous. They can be uh, kept quite simple and to the point, but having audits that where you can go into the site, check off to make sure that these things are being done and have that documented in, you know, in a way that you can draw that information quickly, that will be really, really, really useful if someone does try to make a claim or make complaints or allegations. That's really good. Appreciate that, Simon. Um, I was also going to say, you mentioned about the ventilation just then. Um, and I was wondering, um, we, we often get asked, um, is, is, I mean, t uh, people are speaking to us on the phone every day and they're saying, it's really cold in the classroom. Now, can I close the windows? Um, or is there, is there specific rules around it? Or is it just, um, just simple advice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, as we, you know, as we go through the pandemic and as the evidence base is built, we now know that ventilation is absolutely key. Uh, fresh air, replacement of air that you know, might have uh, COVID uh, particles within it, yeah, that is absolutely key. So windows do need to be open. You need to have a really well ventilated space, as well ventilated as you can manage. However, there are things you can do to obviously try to balance that with comfort because that is also really important. You're not going to achieve a, a good education if the students can't hold a pen because it's too cold. All right. Um, now, the the simple way there is open the windows fully um, when the classroom is empty. So lunch times, break times, before they enter, after they enter. Replace the air in that room at those times as best you can. Um, then obviously you can reduce the amount of opening while the students are in the room. But consider the positioning of the room uh, near the windows. Try to make sure that the, the occurrence of drafts is as low as possible. Um, but then also, you know, there's some uh, basic things in the guidance like, uh, you know, you can now relax your uniform policy to allow students to wear warmer clothing um, and also reevaluate re your heating. Um, obviously, it's going to be a massive expense this year for all education sites, but it, you know, you'll probably need to crank up your heating in most rooms to try and combat the balance issue with, uh, with the ventilation. But yeah, ventilation is absolutely key. That's the fundamental. That's excellent. Thank you very much. I um, had a question for Delia as well, if that's all right. Um, so could you go over um, for our attendees um, really simply, what is the difference between um, the sanitizing and the disinfecting? Um, so there are two things that so people might get confused about the cleaning and the, and the disinfecting, but there's also the sanitizing that's been put in the mix um, during this, this the COVID situation. So just um, in really simple format um, of how, what the difference is between those two. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite grasp the question. Sorry, so so we've got the the, um, the cleaning and the disinfecting and then the sanitization um, as well. The sanitizing has come in as kind of a third, a third um, feature, if you like, during this uh, part, third section of the cleaning during this um, pandemic. Um, and I was wondering if you could go over um, the th that third that third aspect is hasn't always been there um, so I was wondering if you could go over the difference between actual disinfecting and sanitizing um, are there some key differences are there or could you tell us I, I think um, this requires um, probably a little bit more detail than we've got time for now but you, you hear people talk about disinfecting and sanitizing sanitizing is, is more commonly associated to sort of sanitizing hands and sanitizing gels and sanitizing wipes. You rarely hear anybody say, I'm disinfecting my hands. 
because it kind of gives the impression, oh, well, I'm just, I'm going to rinse my hands in Dettol, for example. Um, so I think if, if we looked in detail, you will find that disinfecting and sanitizing are slightly different things. They both, the purpose of both is to annihilate contamination, but either one can do slightly different things depending on the product and what's in it. It's an area that we could actually devote a full session to because it is a very interesting area um, and, and I'd like to spend a bit more time on it, but I think it suffice to say they both have a, a role of annihilating contamination. They do slightly different roles depending on the product that you're buying and what's in it. But the common term sanitizing is usually applied to the cleaning of hands, etc., and disinfecting is more commonly associated with cleaning. Excellent, thank you. So where, where would um, surface sanitizers um, come into that? Surface sanitizers. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So surface sanitizers, and depending on the type that you buy, will have um, different contact times. They will do their job within a specific amount of time. So it really is researching. If you research sanitizers, disinfecting, disinfectants and wipes, you'll find that some have uh, a contact time that's required longer than others. Some are required to be left on the surface to continue to work after you've cleaned and others require rinsing away after a period of time. So as I say, it's quite a big area that could, we could devote quite a lot of time to. I see uh, products out there at the moment that you spray on and leave. Um, investigation and probing is required to see what actually is in that product that we're leaving on the surface and what impact will that have on the next user. We'll see people going around buildings doing contact points time and time again, over and over and over again. And sometimes what we're seeing is a residue being left behind on that contact point that then becomes sticky. The sticky matter that then becomes a membrane that will support the growth of other contaminants in the environment. So when we're using these sanitizers on touch points that are sticky, we need to bear in mind that sticky residue can ultimately become a membrane that will support the growth of contaminants. So may I suggest that Chespat look at another little um, um, video um, audience participation where we can look at those things in a little bit more detail because I think it's a very interesting area. That's good, that's excellent. Yeah, we certainly will look at that. Um, and but this isn't going to be the last webinar by by any uh, by any means. Um, and it's thank you very much for what you've um, what you've brought to us today, all all three panelists, Jasper, Delia and Simon. It's absolutely brilliant. I really appreciate that. And um, we are drawing to a close now. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone here for attending the webinar. It's, we've definitely learned some key things um, about the safety of the facilities, the safety of the trainees, the education needed, um, and on many other things. Um, and it's, if you have any questions, you are welcome to send in those questions to any of the team at Chespack. Um, on a, we've got, well, you should be able to see the contact details on the screen now for all three of the panelists. Um, we appreciate your time and um, <clears throat> we look forward to seeing you in the future. It's been a fantastic um, overload of information and uh, we trust you. You've got everything you need from it and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much.